And at the time of recording this, I literally just looked up. The season is apparently nine episodes long, so unless seven and eight are pretty substantial, there will probably only be one more video to review the rest of the show. I said I'd only do one more video on this series unless something big happened in episode 7 or 8. Well, of course, a few big things happened. So here I am back again to talk about one of the worst video game adaptations of all time, Paramount's Halo Show. Now, unfortunately, they've been even more aggressive than usual taking down some of these past couple episodes, so I'm going to be very careful about how many show clips I use here, and I'm starting to run out of good Halo game footage to show, so, so I'm going to mix in a few other games, probably mostly shooters, for these last two videos. I'm sure at least half of you are just listening and not really watching anyway. So without further ado, let's just get into episodes 7 and 8. Now, episode 7, I already knew about going in, that it was a Quan Ha-centric episode, so trust me, my expectations were pretty low for this, and I actually didn't end up hating it as much as I thought I would. But it still kinda sucks. I won't spoil anything further, let's just get into the synopsis. This is yet another episode that begins with a flashback, this time showing that Quan Ha didn't always support the Resistance efforts. She's eating dinner with a bunch of her family, gets into an argument with her dad, making the point that even if they do win the war, their lives will go unchanged, and her father is giving them false hopes. She then leaves the room. Back in the present, we see that she's driving a dune buggy. Look, I'm not gonna lie to you, I don't always pay 100% attention to these episodes because they're so boring or painful that I forget small details, but I don't remember Soren bringing back a dune buggy with him before she decided to tase his ass, which apparently she left him in the middle of the desert by himself. But we'll get to that in a second. She drives into a sandstorm, then she sees a figure in the distance, stops her car, gets out, and then someone rushes her from behind and throws a bag over her head. Now the next scene confused the absolute hell out of me. It cuts back to the rubble, and we see Soren telling a story of him fighting off some UNSC fighters or some shit. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, this must be another flashback, right? Because he's still unconscious in the middle of the desert the last time we saw him. Well, clearly I was expecting too much from the show, because apparently Soren made his way off of Madrigal off screen. And during this undefined period of time in between episodes, he managed to make it back to the rubble and throw this party for all of his flamboyant pirate buddies. This is just the writers not respecting the intelligence of the viewer. It's skipping over really important shit because there are no fucking consequences for characters unless they die on screen or get injured on screen. You can just expect them to make it to their destination completely fine with no consequences. He was unconscious in the middle of the fucking desert with a busted motorcycle. And if we're expected to believe that he's the one who brought the dune buggy, he doesn't even have a functioning ride outside of the desert. Now, we can infer he was able to find civilization in the time he was gone, so I guess he could make it back there again. But again, it just has no sense of realism for the show. He's in the desert, he's wearing, like, heavy armor. He should be extremely dehydrated at this point. I don't even know if they had water, but you're not supposed to think about it. And fuck it, I'm not gonna think about it any further. So anyway... Apparently, Soren's buddy is named Squirrel, and, and it's a pretty fitting name. He certainly looks like one of those conniving rodent types. And he challenges Soren's authority during the party, which obviously he doesn't like. Then back on Madrigal, we see that Quan Ha has been taken to some Amazon warrior tribe in the middle of the desert. There's only so many times I can say during this series, this isn't Halo, which of course the people who read the books are like, well actually, in the books, it's a fucking video game series first and foremost. And as many people have already told me, what little they've taken from the books they butchered anyway, so who cares? 
My mind will be blown if at some point in the Halo books there was a desert Amazon tribe who protected a mystical well that was a portal. And yes, I'm spoiling a major plot point from later in the episode, but I was gonna get there anyway in five minutes. So the tribe leader, I presume, tells Quan Ha that she's not ready to assume the responsibility that her family had protecting Madrigal for generations. Then it cuts to Venture, the evil resistance guy who is a plant for the UNSC, and apparently he knows that Soren left the planet, so now he's gonna try and kill Quan Ha once and for all, and they directly refer to the Amazon tribe, as I just called them, as Desert Witches. I know I sound like a broken record, man, but witches? Really? There's no fucking magic in Halo. Even Forerunner technology is technology at the end of the day. Okay, whatever, moving on. The next scene is completely pointless as it shows Soren and Squirrel having a little bit of a dispute where Soren lies and says that maybe he treated his partner poorly, which is just a setup for the next scene where he obviously shows him who's boss. It's very cliche. Now back on Madrigal again, this is kind of a weird scene and is dragged out for a very long time. It's almost 10 minutes long, so I'm just going to keep this brief. Basically, the desert witch leader explains what I just spoiled in the last scene, that Quan Ha's ancestor found this well in the middle of the desert, which is actually a portal, and we're never told what the portal is to, but I'm guessing it's a portal to one of the Halo rings because they have to tie this back into the main plot somehow. And so, Quan Ha has to take a test to determine if she's worthy of protecting this portal. And to do that, she has to go on a vision quest. So she drinks some magical drug, has this really vivid dream where she has to fight Master Chief for some reason. And he actually kicks her ass multiple times, which is kind of satisfying to see, I'm not gonna lie. And eventually she realizes she needs to work with him, not against him. Then she sees a vision of her father. He gives her some inspiring words to encourage her to be a good leader and play to her strengths. And that's the end of her vision quest. Then back on Soren's side of the plot, we see a UNSC freighter that's been taken over by the pirates. And Soren uses a forklift to smash Squirrel's foot, making an example out of him in front of his own men and to show him who's really in charge here. Then back at his home on the rubble, his wife tells him that Quan Ha's bounty has tripled and that she's still alive, which of course is a setup for him to go back to save her despite the fact that she could have very easily gotten him killed. I know I'm derailing my synopsis again to complain, but this just feels like something out of Star Wars, where the Han Solo roguish type secretly has a heart of gold and has to go back and save the hero at the last minute. This whole Madrigal subplot feels like something out of Star Wars and no doubt was inspired by it as most hack diversity writers love Disney products and have to emulate everything they see instead of writing something original. Change my mind. Back on Madrigal, Quan Ha was told to visit the place where this all began, which obviously, as we know, is the outpost from the first episode. She travels back there. Apparently, nobody has shown up to clean up anything, as there's still corpses of elites strewn about. And shockingly, don't look like they've decayed even a day. No decomposition whatsoever. I suppose that would have been too much work for the CGI artists to create some kind of new model or something. I don't fucking know. It's just laziness. So next scene, we see Venture talking to the Indian general woman who betrayed the resistance and he gives an evil speech. She has a change of heart and doesn't want to help him anymore, which doesn't matter because I guess he had drones set up above the outpost because he found Quan Ha and then he shoots the general chick in the back. Then the show cuts back to Quan Ha as Soren somehow finds her. I don't know why he would think to look back at her original outpost considering he's never been there before. Maybe he had a tracker on her. Maybe he was listening in on Venture's communications. I don't know. They could have just had one throwaway line to explain this. But of course the show doesn't explain it. After a little bit of convincing, she obviously accepts his help. 
and Venture shows up shortly afterward. So the two have to hatch a plan to defeat his vastly superior numbers, and Quan comes up with the idea to fill up this hydrogen gas tank and just shoot it and let the explosion kill them all after Quan and Soren make their way to a steel vault on the other side of the camp. Then the scene that follows is actually a pretty cool action scene, but before I get to that, I do have another small nitpick. I've complimented the prop design before on this show, but I think they kind of got lazy at this point. I didn't point this out in previous episodes, but the revolver that Sorn uses is a real revolver, the Rhino. It's very noticeable because it shoots from the bottom of the cylinder instead of the top like other revolvers. And the same goes for the Vector, which is what all of Venture's men are using. The only reason I point this out is because it's a missed opportunity to show some more weapons from the games, like the SMGs from Halo 2. It's just something that kind of annoys me because in previous episodes they've shown plenty of actual guns from the games. But I'm not gonna lie to you, this action scene is actually pretty good. Soren shows off his Spartan skills, kills a shit ton of dudes by himself with his revolver and in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it's decently entertaining. Again, the only other thing that kind of annoyed me is it shows how dumb that other scene was when he shot at the assassin, because I don't even think he misses one time in this action scene. While Soren fights off most of Venture's men by himself, Quan makes her way through a bunch of tunnels under the outpost. She finds a sticky grenade on an elite and slaps it on the back of somebody, which would have been cool, but they fucked up the CGI, the grenade doesn't glow blue. I don't know if they just missed this in editing or something, but that's not how sticky grenades look in the games. It would have taken two seconds to look this up, guys. But anyway, eventually Soren gets cornered. Of course, Venture has to be the most cliche bad guy possible and monologues before shooting him. And so Quan finds Master Chief's assault rifle, which he left behind for some reason. And it even has his fucking number on it, which makes no sense. So of course Quan gets to shoot the hydrogen tank. They quickly make their way inside the vault, which has windows on it for some reason, so some of the fire gets inside, but they're completely fine. And I only just noticed now, above this outpost is what appears to be a space elevator? Wouldn't something as expensive to make as a space elevator be, I don't know, defended? Even if the outpost gets wiped out, why wouldn't Venture move in his men? They just wanted to have a really cool visual, obviously, for the massive explosion. But this just doesn't make any sense. Obviously, the space elevator is there to ferry the hydrogen into space. Just reading the Halo wiki what these space elevators were used for. So obviously, this is a valuable resource just being left to rot for who knows how long since the first episode. Alright, whatever. Anyway, so after the explosion is gone, there's no corpses left from Venture's men, which is kind of weird. And despite the fact that we see him swallowed up by the explosion, considering we don't see a body and this is a TV show, there's a very good chance he survived that somehow. Then in the final scene of the episode, we see Soren leaving the planet once again. Because he's a pirate, he has no place in a resistance effort. And Quan Ha, of course, wants to rise up a new resistance to take back Madrigal, which is so goddamn irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. Billions of aliens are trying to genocide the human race. This is not a time for us to be divided. Even if Venture was evil, dividing up humanity is just going to give them even less of a chance of winning. But, but I don't know why I'm expecting this show to have any sort of gray morality or maturity around this subject. It's just generic rebellion versus the Empire Star Wars shit, which makes no sense when the Covenant are the real evil Empire here. So, I'm not gonna lie to you, I don't think it's a bad episode, mostly because the action scene was decent. Plus, if this wasn't a Halo show, this would actually be kind of okay. A little bit too woke for my taste, where of course the white guy is the bad guy, and most of the good guys are women, except for one black guy to try and keep some of the male audience. Still not really a good episode. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody if you're trying to get back into the show. It's not bad, it's mostly inoffensive and has one decent scene.
now we get to episode eight now believe it or not this is the worst episode in the series i know that might be unbelievable if you haven't seen it if you have you know exactly why and honestly i've had a few drinks because otherwise this would piss me off beyond belief now i just can't take it seriously anymore this is the moment that the show becomes so bad that it's good I'd rather a show be entertaining than boring, and this episode is entertaining, even if it's for the wrong reasons. So I'm just gonna save you a lot of time and just summarize the first 10 minutes of this episode as, Master Chief and McKee are falling in love with each other. Yes, we have a real love story in Halo. Worse than the one in Halo 4, I would argue. We also find out that this city is not New Alexandria, it is Reach City. That's fucking stupid. That's like a city being called Earth City. Come on, man, really? Anyway, finally 10 minutes in, something of relevance happens. We see that another planet has been glassed by the Covenant, which is probably the first time in this series that the plot has actually taken them seriously and they feel like a real threat to humanity. It only took eight fucking episodes. Honestly, I feel nothing because we've never seen this planet before now, and the scene honestly just feels out of place with the rest of the episode. Master Chief tries to convince Captain Keys and Admiral Chick to let McKee use the artifact to find the Covenant. Then next scene, we see Kai display how strong the Spartans are by lifting, I guess, a huge engine block? I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. And then shortly afterward, a warthog with people sitting in it. Which is kinda cool, I guess. Next scene shows Miranda still trying to decipher the Covenant recording from the frigate that was destroyed a few episodes ago. Obviously, we the audience know it was McKee on board, so you already know where this is going. And we have a little bit of a father-daughter moment between Miranda and Captain Keys, which is kinda cute, I suppose. Now we finally get to the scene that makes this episode, or breaks this episode, it's where it truly jumps the shark. Master Chief heads into McKee's room or cell, depending on how you look at it. He finds the book that the little boy read to her when she was a child, and this leads to the two of them having sex. Now when you play Halo, do you imagine even for a second, Master Chief having sex. Is that something that pops into your brain at any point? Probably not. What makes this even worse, and something that some other people have pointed out that I probably have to agree with at this point, is that McKee is supposed to be, I guess, a writer self-insert replacement for the Arbiter. So when you think about it, this is just a fan fiction of Master Chief and the Arbiter having sex. But wait, it gets worse. Cortana is watching them having sex, and she has the weirdest fucking look on her face. I guess it's a look of jealousy, or maybe slight arousal? I don't know, man, but now everybody is talking about Cortana being a cuck queen. Holy shit, dude, that is so funny. Oh my god. I can't believe this is real. This is an actual real show that was made that has millions of dollars behind it. As far as we know, 343 and Microsoft approved of this. Or maybe they just let Paramount do whatever the fuck they wanted. No matter what the answer is, I am just fucking blown away. I have no words for this. You need to see the scene for yourself. Obviously, don't support Paramount. But it needs to be seen to be believed. I am not exaggerating how fucked this is. So right after this scene, we see McKee forcibly remove her tiny energy blade implant. Honestly, I have no idea why. I suppose it's supposed to symbolize her betraying the Covenant. But really, it's completely pointless. It's just to make her powerless for the following scenes. And it's pretty gross. That implant was pretty deep in her finger. So, with a hint of jealousy, Cortana tells Halsey that John is in love with McKee and clearly reflecting her Flash clone turned AI, Halsey also is jealous. She clearly still wants to be the mommy of all the Spartans. Then Captain Keys shows up, 
and tells her that she needs to be off planet by noon that day and attempts to guilt trip her despite the fact she's clearly a sociopath at best and likely psycho. So it doesn't really work and she says she'll basically sacrifice everything to evolve humanity into something greater, which is more or less her goal of the Spartan program. Obviously, Captain Keys is upset by this, that she's given up her marriage, her child, her relationship with Master Chief for this goal, and he storms off. We also find out what the purpose of the contact was from Episode 6. It was to copy her daughter's ocular signature, because I guess they use eye scanner technology for clearance in the UNSC, and now she has access to their systems. She uses this clearance to contact McKee in her cell and essentially tell her that humans can't be trusted, they'll always be evil, and if the Halo Ring is a weapon, they're going to use it to destroy themselves and they need to evolve beyond emotions. You know, basically a supervillain speech that you've heard several times in other media by now. She also admits, whether McKee realizes it or not, that she's seen them having sex. So, she wants McKee to convince John that they need to steal the artifact and bring it to Halsey because only she can be trusted to use the Halo to further humanity. McKee doesn't buy this bullshit and so she ends the transmission. After we're subjected to this, we get to the part of the episode that basically derails the entire plot of the rest of the show. It kind of reminds me of the end of the first episode, where realistically, this should change the entire trajectory of the Halo universe from this point forward. But I feel like somehow in the season finale, everything's gonna go back to normal at the end, despite the fact that would make no goddamn sense. Dr. Halsey decides to commit treason and orders the Spartans to capture Master Chief, McKee, and the artifact just between the three of them fight their way through likely hundreds of UNSC soldiers and as we find out in just one scene actually just two of them because as expected Kai decides to ask one too many questions and so Halsey orders Vanek and Riz I only know Riz's name because they showed it on screen right before this to knock her ass out and handcuff her to a sink in the bathroom. At the same time, Miranda Keys finally filters out all the noise from the transmission and figures out that it was McKee who killed everyone on board that frigate. Also meanwhile, Master Chief and McKee are on their way to the artifact room in an elevator, and McKee asks him what they're going to do with the Halo Ring after the war. I'm assuming this is supposed to parallel Quan Ha's conversation with her dad in the beginning of the previous episode. And back to Halsey's side of things, she sees where John and McKee are, and sends Riz and Vanek over there. And Cortana has doubts about this whole thing. Now this is something that absolutely makes no sense if you've been paying even the least bit of attention to the show at this point. Cortana decides to betray Halsey and help Master Chief instead of disabling him. But Master Chief has been a dick to her for the entire show. Not once has he been nice to her. Why the fuck would Cortana betray Halsey now of all times? Has she fallen in love with him? I was just fucking joking about that before. But honestly, I think they're going with the Halo 4 side of things, where she really was jealous and wants to sleep with Master Chief herself somehow. I can't think of any other explanation. And then we get a shittily choreographed fight scene, where both Vanek and Riz have no problem nearly killing their former teammate and leader even though Halsey told them to just knock him out or handcuff him or disable him in some way. They're clearly willing to kill him, but despite them being in armor and Master Chief being unarmed and not wearing armor, they struggle to beat him within a few seconds. None of Master Chief's punches should even do anything. This is the same problem I had with Dune, where the shields can magically stop any high velocity object, but something moving slow can make it through. How does that make any fucking sense? And that's also not how it works in the games for Halo anyway. 
Him smacking them with the weights and punching them shouldn't do anything. Cortana helps him out, which explains some of it, but Vanek literally punches him in the back of the head multiple times wearing a thousand pound Mjolnir armor. I don't care how reinforced his skull is, his brain would be fucking mush. Eventually they get the upper hand on Master Chief and Vanek is about to shoot him in the head, which is not what Dr. Halsey told them to do. Why would he try to kill him? Kai shows up having broken free and disables Vanek, but Riz has a shot on his head too. Luckily, she has a small amount of humanity left and decides not to shoot him. Again, neither one of them should try to kill him. They were not told to do that and they have no reason to kill their former leader. Meanwhile, while this was happening, there was actually two other scenes going on, which I purposely decided not to split between because it would just be more confusing. Again, it's what these TV shows love to do. They don't want to just show you the action. They have to cut between scenes to artificially raise the tension. But all it does is annoy you if you notice that sort of thing, which of course I do. I've seen enough of these shitty shows to know how the pacing works. So before the fight, Master Chief had sent McKee away to try and get help. But unfortunately, Admiral Chick and Captain Keys don't trust her. And also, I forgot to mention, Kai ordered some guy to send a bunch of troops to Halsey's ship so she couldn't get away, which is what was going to happen anyway. Her plan doesn't make any fucking sense. The problem with writing geniuses in shows is that a character is only as smart as the writers are, and we know these writers are idiots. This plan was never going to work. So back to the other scene, the Admiral and Keys try to detain McKee, but eventually she breaks free and touches the artifact. Is transported back to the Halo ring, sucks John in somehow, and so the episode ends with McKee telling John that she's going to leave, presumably to go back with the Covenant, since the humans are so obviously evil and can't be redeemed, just like she always thought as a child. I fucking hate this show, man. I hate it so much. I'm glad you guys like these videos, or at least like me suffering through the show, because I can tell you, I really can't take it anymore. It's starting to break me, dude. That was not clickbait. I really am just fucking done with this. I'm so glad there's only one more episode. This is certainly crossed over into unwatchable territory. The fanfiction tier writing is so unbearable. I can't fucking believe that the Neil Blomkamp movie got cancelled, but this made it through. Does that just show that Microsoft doesn't care about the Halo franchise anymore? Probably, if I had to guess. And even if that really betrayed what Halo stands for, there's no way it could have been worse than this show. It directly shits in the fans' mouths, and there's still people defending this shit. And you wonder why I say gaming is dying. It's because there's so many fucking pathetic fanboys that'll defend any franchise just because they liked it when they were younger. That's literally it. It's either children or nostalgic fanboys. That's what it is every single time people have the lowest imaginable standards for entertainment. Alright, I'll save the rest of my vitriol for the final episode. I'm sure I'll repeat a lot of my same sentiments that I've said in this and the previous videos. But yes, we've got one more. Even if it's good, it couldn't possibly save this show. So, hopefully I'll have a real game review in between now and then. No promises, a lot of my previous plans kind of fell through. That top 10 list wasn't very good. Some of the other shit I was making, I was just kind of going through the motions. In any case, I can promise you I am working on a real game review right now, but I'm not going to announce anything in case it turns out to be shit or I lose motivation. So I'll just leave you with that. I'll see you next time, guys.